Friends, today's story is of the deaths of Lisa Millican and Janice K. Chatman. Judy Neely was sentenced in Alabama's electric chair in 1983 and at the age of 18 was the youngest woman ever to be so sentenced. Wow. The murder for which she was tried and convicted was protracted and cruel. But Judy was a poor common girl from the deep south, a product of both a troubled home and the juvenile justice system. So was the victim for whose murder she was convicted, 13-year-old Lisa Ann Millican. You see, Lisa's life was taken in DeKalb County, Alabama. No crew from Court TV or the Law Network covered this trial because they didn't exist back then. The Neely trial was local news, mainly good for a lot of gossip in Fort Payne and some coverage in the bigger Alabama papers. Had the location of Lisa Milliken's body not been brought to the attention of DeKalb County authorities, she may have remained undiscovered for years. It was an 80-foot drop from the precipice to the floor of Little River Canyon, where Lisa's body had landed. The area was densely wooded and often used as a garbage dump by locals. Lisa was last seen in Rome, in the state of Georgia, and the search for her was focused there, some 35 miles away. In fact, the Rome police and a Rome radio station had each received a phone call revealing the location of the body and the Rome police had been to the area indicated in the calls but had found nothing. On the evening of September the 29th, 1982, a call came into the DeKalb County Sheriff's Office in Fort Payne. The then unidentified caller gave detailed directions to the location of a young girl's body. Let me reiterate, Judy called the police did not reveal who she was and told the police, hey, there's a body I know somewhere. At night, by the beam of a flashlight, Deputy James Mays and other lawmen from around the county found Lisa Millican. She had been shot and lay crumpled over a fallen tree. She was brought out of the canyon by rope the following day and investigators found three used syringes among the debris into which she had fallen. Hanging from a branch between the precipice and the canyon floor, they found a pair of women's blue jeans that appeared bloodstained. Now, because the crime scene contained lots of garbage from previous visitors, authorities weren't certain these items were relevant to their case, but delivered them to the Alabama Department of Forensic Science in Huntsville in the hopes of a lead. So the question remained, what happened to this young girl? I'm about to tell you. So if you do end up liking this video, please subscribe. Also, follow me on Instagram. Links are in the description. Though Lisa was found in DeKalb County, investigators quickly decided that since she had disappeared from Rome, the case should be worked from there. The police in Rome had been investigating Lisa's disappearance for several days, ever since she had gone missing from the Riverbend Mall on September the 25th. Lisa had been part of a group of girls from the Ethel Harps home in Cedartown, Georgia, who had gone on a supervised outing to the mall. The Harps home was a facility for troubled girls and it was initially hoped that Lisa had simply run away. It's because she had a history of such behavior. But as days passed and Lisa did not return to any of her usual haunts, hope faded and while it was tragic, it didn't come as a shock that she was found dead. Lisa was from Lafayette, Georgia and had been removed from her parents' home as had her three siblings following allegations of sexual abuse. She was sexually precocious and unpopular with the other girls in the various facilities where she found herself. She had once kicked the girl in the stomach hard enough to induce a miscarriage. So the call to the Rome Police Department had been taped and while playing it for Mike Jones of the Walker County Department of Family and Children Services, Detective Keynes got an important bit of information. The caller said, 
Y'all looking for Lisa Ann Millican on run from the Harpst home? A more dramatic scene took place when Detective Keynes played the tape for 13 year old Debbie Smith, a local girl who had been approached and offered a ride by a woman in a brown car on October the 4th. Two employees of Rome's Youth Development Center, better known as YDC, Linda Adair and Ken Dooley, had had incidents at their homes on successive nights. Someone shot into Dooley's house on September the 11th and a Molotov cocktail was tossed into Adair's driveway on September the 12th. No one was injured, though while the police were investigating the scene at Adair's home. She received a phone call from an anonymous female who referred to the shooting at Dooley's house and the firebombing and claimed, You both will die before the night is over. So who is this individual? We've got a random woman calling the police, telling them there's a body somewhere, a house has been firebombed and there's also a shooting. What is going on? Detective Keynes then made a connection. You see, the Youth Development Center was a juvenile facility. Mike Jones of Walker County had told him the caller on the Millican tape probably had a juvenile record. Now, Keynes had something to pursue. Remembering the previous abductors had said the cars bore out-of-state license plates. So Keynes asked juvenile officer Elaine Snow for a list of all the girls who had been placed in the YDC from out of state. She gave him a list of 25 names. So having gone through all the paperwork and all the names, he found someone that fit the bill, Judith Ann Neely. He assembled pictures for a photo lineup. Debbie Smith recognized Neely immediately and gave Keynes the positive ID he needed. He started searching for Neele. He didn't have to search long. You see, on October the 9th, Judy Neele had been arrested at a motel in Murfreesboro, Tennessee for passing bad checks. Her husband Alvin was arrested a few days later. On October the 14th, Keynes got the word that his suspects were in custody. Lawmen from Rome and DeKalb County hurried to Murfreesboro. If they expected their Sussex to be guarded and evasive with their answers, they were mightily surprised. Alvin Neele, though he asked for and got a lawyer, waived his right to remain silent and gave a lengthy, detailed statement that implicated Judy as the criminal mastermind and sexual deviant of the pair. He explained that it was Judy who took the life of Millican and Chatman. Alvin said she's a dangerous person and that he feared her. He drew a map indicating the location of Chatman's body and swore that Judy had compelled his participation in any sexual abuse of Millican and Chatman. While Keynes questioned Alvin, Judy was being interviewed down the hall. She repeatedly stated that she didn't need a lawyer and answered any and all questions calmly and in detail. She admitted to the firebombing at Linda Adair's and the shooting at Ken Dooley's. But she said the reason why is because when Judy was in the YDC, Adair forced her to participate in sexual activities, or in particular, to have sex with Dooley, and that she had been part of a prostitution ring operating out of the facility. Then chillingly, she told of the abductions of Millican and Chatman and what they endured in the days before their deaths. She would continue her confession and add even more details after she was transported to Fort Payne and formally charged with Millican's murder. So Judy explained that they were in the Riverbend Mall in the city of Rome. She sees Millican from afar, walks up to her in a video arcade area of the mall and just strikes a conversation. Lisa had gone with her willingly, she said, because she didn't want to return to the Harpst home. That night, they had driven around for hours with Judy's children in the back seat, finally checking into a motel. Yes, she had her own children, and with her children in the car, she was taking her future victim with her. The next few days followed a similar pattern, she said, with aimless driving during the day, and nights spent in motels 
where Lisa slept on the floor, handcuffed to the bed frame. Judy had been afraid, she said, that upon her release, Lisa would tell authorities where she'd been, implicating Judy, and that Lisa would be placed back in the YDC. According to Judy, it was much better for Lisa to die than for her to go to the police and tell her, well, this woman kidnapped me, handcuffed me to the bed and wouldn't let me go. Judy drove Lisa to Rocky Glade, a secluded area in DeKalb County at the edge of Little River Canyon. As the children slept in the car, Judy walked Lisa over to a tree and told her to lie down. She said, I told her I was going to give her a shot to put her to sleep so I could leave and she wouldn't know where I was going. She then injected liquid Drano into her neck. She had heard that this was a quick, undetectable way to kill, but it didn't seem to be working. She administered another injection to the other side of Lisa's neck, this time of liquid plumber. Lisa was still conscious. More injections followed to each of Lisa's arms and each of her buttocks. Judy waited half an hour. Lisa was in pain but still conscious. So Judy had her step to the edge of the canyon and turn away. Lisa begged to be taken back to the Harp's home and as she faced the expanse of the canyon pleading for her life, Judy shot her in the back. Lisa fell backwards instead of into the canyon so Judy had to push her over the edge getting blood on her jeans in the process. Judy changed her jeans then threw the bloody pair and the syringes into the canyon. She drove away toward Fort Payne. Her children were asleep in the back seat. As Judy confessed, authorities went looking for Janice Chapman. Her body was found where Alvin said it would be, off a back road in rural Chattanooga County, Georgia. Meanwhile, a warrant had been executed at the Murfreesboro home of Barbara Adams. She was Judy's mother. The Neelys had been staying there prior to their arrests and the evidence of their crimes was abundant throughout the house. Among other items, the police recovered handcuffs, radios and several guns and knives. Now regarding the trial itself, Bob French had his work cut out for him. He had not wanted to serve as Judy's court appointed defence and after their first meeting, he came away disliking her intensely. Still, he would do his best. As Judy was under 21, he began by seeking youthful offender status for her. The judge, Randall Cole, denied this motion. French then asked the psychological tests to be administered to determine Judy's fitness for trial. The tests were done in January 1983 and Judy was found fit for trial, with superior intelligence and no tendency toward delusion or harming herself. The trial was scheduled to begin on March the 7th, 1983. I wasn't even born then. In the meantime, French set about making Judy more presentable. She had come into custody decidedly unkempt and pregnant with her third child, and French knew he needed to get her cleaned up before she went in front of the jury. Her baby, a boy, was born while she waited for her court date. She had dental work done by Dr. Stephen Brewer and French bought her several outfits at Black's department store, the nicest ladies clothing store in the county, so she'd have something to wear during the trial. Though prosecutor Richard Egu noticed French was preparing Judy for her court appearance, he did not have a clue as to what her defense would be until the first day of the trial and imagine that she's pregnant and she's probably going to go to jail for the rest of her life what's going to happen to that baby wow it was evident from the sort of questions french asked prospective jurors that he was going to try and portray judy as a victim a victim of her husband alvin neely under whose irresistible control she had been during the crime among the first witnesses called by the prosecution were two young women and a teenage girl who had been apparently Judy's prospective victim. Debbie Smith identified Judy as the woman who had tried to pick her up as she walked home from school on October the 4th, 1982. 
Susan Klontz identified Judy as the woman who had approached her and asked if she was alone at Aladdin's castle in Rome's Riverbend Mall on September the 25th, the day Lisa disappeared. So it seemed that she was looking for any girl. She asked one, couldn't get her, so she took Lisa. Diane Bobo identified Judy as the woman who had tried to get her to go for a ride on the afternoon on October the 3rd. None of these witnesses saw Alvin in the vicinity when she was approached and none thought Judy appeared beaten or abused. The next witness, John Hancock, told the story of his abduction just as he had told it before. And Igu tried to emphasize the fact that it was Judy who had done the abducting and who had eventually shot him. French though got Hancock to admit that although Judy had seemed in control, it was actually Alvin who had given her directions throughout the abduction. Alvin had decided where they would drive and where they would meet, and when Judy seemed to dawdle before shooting Hancock, Alan had yelled for her to hurry. He was in charge of that evening's transactions, French asked, and Hancock quietly answered, Yes sir. Just to be clear, John Hancock was the boyfriend of Chatterman. They attacked them both, they shot John, he survived, but they took Chatman back to their place, then the abuse occurred. The first defense witness French called was Joanne Browning, Alvin Neely's first wife. She had been married to Alvin for three years in the mid-70s and was mother to three of his children. Browning testified that he abused her throughout her marriage, even when she was pregnant, and that he had drugged and tried to sexually assault her teenage sister. Dirty bastard. She said that she tried to leave several times, but Alvin had threatened the children. She only escaped him because he had suddenly become interested in Judy. Igu damaged her credibility though by establishing that she was definitely a bigamist and probably a liar as well. This is because she got married to another man before her divorce with Alvin was finalized. Though she claimed that Alvin had abused her around 800 times, Browning had never suffered a broken bone and though she'd been pregnant for 27 months of her three-year marriage, None of her children were damaged by the abuse and all three pregnancies concluded normally. She left the witness stand angry and in tears. The following afternoon, French called Judy to the stand. Immediately her appearance and demeanor clashed with his portrayal of her as a victim. She had cleaned up nicely, was no longer pregnant, and at 5 foot 10, she cut a rather imposing figure. She bantered and laughed easily at the defense table and had one mannerism that was so alarming, French felt a need to explain it to the jury. He asked her, when you are afraid or nervous, how do you handle it? And she replied by saying, I smile a lot, which is kind of creepy if you ask me. She was smiling even as she said it, and she continued to smile as French led her through questions about her childhood and her early relationship with Alvin. She had met when Judy was 15, and he had been an ardent and romantic suitor. She left her unstable home willingly. But Alvin's sexual advances were always crude and selfish and increasingly violent, she said, and from the start, she performed as his servant. She claimed she bathed him and dried him and combed his hair, and when he had jobs at convenience stores, it was she who would do the stocking and sweeping and mopping. She cooked for him and tied his shoes, she said, and when she did any of her tasks wrong, he abused her. He taught her robbery and forgery. He was insanely jealous even though Judy said she'd always been faithful to him. The stories about the abuse she'd supposedly received at the YDC were of Alvin's making, not hers. But these stories at the YDC never happened. And if we go back to Millican, going back to their home, being abused sexually, then thrown off the canyon, what they did to Chapman, and now this idea that essentially Alvin wanted her to worship him, to bathe him, to cook for him. Both of these are just sick individuals. Judy went into excruciating detail about various assaults, and her role as victim was gradually becoming more believable. On the last of Judy's four days of testimony, French began asking questions about Lisa Milliken's abduction and murder. Alvin wanted a virgin, Judy said, so she had procured him one. 
she delivered Lisa to him for his use and at his instruction took part in the abuse. She witnessed Alvin's many sexual assaults on Lisa as did her children who were with them the whole time. Alvin had chosen the spot for Lisa's death and had been at Judy's side issuing orders the whole time. After Lisa was dead, Judy claimed that Alvin masturbated. Ew. He had ordered her to make the calls to the Roman Fort Payne police and she had done everything he said because she was afraid of him. She admitted to the abduction and murder of Janice Chapman, imputing these to her fear of Alvin as well. She had picked up another girl in Murphy's Borough for Alvin's use, but just then she was arrested. Richard Egu didn't believe any of Judy's testimony. He had seen her when she was first brought to Fort Payne and then she had been hard and cold. Though it was incredible that someone only 18 years old could be so indifferent and depraved, Egu thought Judy definitely was. He quickly tried to counter French methodically established defense. Judy claimed to have been abused countless times but had only suffered two broken fingers and a slightly chipped tooth. And she had been acting on her own, she admitted, during the shooting of Janice Chapman. The first shot had been on Alvin's orders, but the other two were because Chapman was screaming and Judy was afraid someone would hear. He didn't tell you to shoot her two more times in the chest just to shut her up, did he? Igu asked. No, sir, Judy answered. Igu then produced a series of photographs featuring Alvin and Judy posing merrily with various guns and family members. In each, Judy was smiling, not meekly, but apparently quite happily. Alvin had arranged all the pictures, Judy said, and had ordered her to smile like that. Finally, Igu took Judy through the events that took place at the edge of Little River Canyon the previous September. For every why, there was an answer, because Al told me to. Judy claimed the only things she did on her own were eat and go to the bathroom. That absolutely everything else about her life had been dictated by her husband. Igu called Dr. Alexandra Salilas of the Alabama Department of Mental Health as a rebuttal witness, and he testified that Judy had known the difference between right and wrong at the time of her crime. And he said that she made the conscious decision to kill. French tried to get the doctor to say that, according to the established clinical definition, Judy had been brainwashed, but he said this did not happen. Throughout a convoluted and strenuous line of questioning, he maintained that Judy retained her free will. His testimony did grave damage to Judy's defense, most remarkably when French asked him if the bruises Judy had in one of the pictures were consistent with assault with a baseball bat. Not necessarily, he said, a pinch to the arm would give you the same result. French was flummoxed. In your opinion, he said, this could be caused by twisting skin or pinching? Certainly, said the doctor, so the wounds were not as bad as they claimed. He was the last witness to be called. Judith Ann Neele was found guilty of murder and abduction. That afternoon, the prosecution and defense delivered arguments in front of the jury in the sentencing hearing. Late that night, the jury delivered its recommendation to Judge Cole. By a 10 to 2 vote, they recommended that Judy be sentenced to life in prison. In Alabama, however, a jury's recommendation in a capital case is not the final word on the matter. It serves only to inform the judge of the jury's opinion. The final decision is with the judge themselves. After a brief sentencing hearing on April the 18th, 1983, Judge Cole sentenced Judy to die in Alabama's electric chair. She was 18 years old. Anxious to avoid another death sentence, Judy pled guilty to kidnapping in the Chapman Hancock case and agreed to testify against Alvin. Alvin, afraid of Judy's testimony, pled guilty to kidnapping with bodily harm and intent to murder. He was sentenced to two life terms. Over the years, Judy's case wound its way through the appeal process and on January the 15th, 1999, her sentence was commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And the only way to describe these two individuals 
They're just a bunch of morons. Comment, tell me what you think.